you know, it's ironic that space ran out and I had to move some things to storage. It's just right after I talked about pack or herd. And the ironic thing is, as I'm sure you know, because I just heard you talking about it in your attempt to construct me as, what did you call me? Active shooter? You know that the day before I was kidnapped, I was at the library looking at an article about lionesses that hunt in packs, that there's different kinds of strategies that lionesses, specifically in the wild, engage when they are hunting their prey. And there's more assertive female lionesses, and there are more faster ones. Some have speed, some have brawn, some take a long route, some go straight at it. They actually will set up a trap a little further down and a couple will come out and try to scare the animal into moving so that the one that's the swiftest and the one that's got the most bulk and power will be able to take it down and then together they feast. That's not what you get, however, if you're being attempted for recruitment into or cultivation as a specific kind of lone terrorist in a particular race performance of domestic terrorist, right? I don't know what their animal totem would be to try to project onto somebody else. I saw the falcon with the heart ripped out right in front of Chase Bank. That was cute, right? I saw that. But I'm not going to speculate what somebody else thought would be an appropriate desecration of somebody's concept of spirituality in their psychological operations aimed at trying to recruit somebody into acts of terrorism. I will say that when there is public reporting on efforts for political action around racial justice that has um, identified a particular racial group that's disproportionately being targeted by police in encounters that escalate into acts of violence, that there is a specific manner in which the narrative around community, terrorism, and trauma is promulgated that is distinct and different from the narrative around community trauma that is experienced in regards to the school shooter. For instance, if you are part of a community where a young man has been shot by police and been killed, you, I've never to this day heard about demands for trauma counseling, demands for increased mental health treatment to deal with trauma, and hence increased demand for access to medications, including psychotropics, in order to treat people identified as having a trauma because of that incident. However, in the last three years, at least in the state of Texas and also in the state of Florida, I'm not sure about what happened in Colorado. I'm not sure specifically about California and I'm not sure specifically about the Ukraine, but those are five school shootings that I have been apprised of in some manner, real time as they occurred and then was able to track them to events that were part of a specific pattern of racketeering activity that had it been acted on at the time could have been forestalled before it allowed for the material conditions to come into being that provided the financing for those school shootings. In uh, at least two of them, an immediate response was that there needed to be some medical intervention in terms of responding to the trauma associated with the shooting by the community. And that would also include mental health counseling for those that were witness, i.e. an increased intercession of the phar pharmaceutical industry into the lives of minors. And so when there's an allowance for a specific kind of racialization in association with these specific kinds of community traumas and the responses are significantly and materially different than the kinds of responses that are demanded as political rights or as some form of restitution 
in uh, communities of color concentrated in urban areas, then this calls into question concepts of, well, what is it that the community is seeking to be restituted for? What is the trauma? What is the loss? And if you're someone like I am that considers young people to be in a situation where they are developing their personalities and they're developing their own concepts of selfhood in order to participate in a form of leadership later in life or at the time, what kind of leadership is being targeted for liquidation? Then that brings up the questions of the community responses. How does it actually restitute the community to drug children or to drug young leaders that were forced to watch what happened when somebody that was in their midst ended up coming and visiting this violent reprisal internally to the community? How does it impact the concept of what it needs to be restituted when somebody needs to be argued as not being the typical criminal that's being constructed through a racial paradigm involving and involved in police violence, but was an innocent victim that was taken out of the community because they represent what? And their death represents a loss of what? This is a consideration of what is considered to be the values of the community that are being targeted for liquidation. And so this needs to, to be taken into account when one discusses what the value overall is of discussing domestic terrorism in a context of liquidation of political rights. Now, I bring this up specifically at this time frame because in the summer of 2000. 16, I went to the Department of Justice in Chicago and I submitted some information to the Department of Justice because I had been told, by the way, by African-American men that were homeless and with me on the street. We were having a conversation one night over dinner and they were talking about how they had heard that the Department of Justice had just created a commission to investigate the shooting death of Laquan McDonald and specifically to investigate shooting deaths of black men by the Chicago Police Department. The Department of Justice had a special commission in Chicago specifically to investigate the Chicago Police specifically. And after talking with them and talking about my feelings on it, um, somebody actually recommended, well, why don't you go talk to them? See if you, and, and so I did. I ended up going down a time later and I submitted some writing samples of mine that were part of an analysis and an investigation um, that I was already doing about my concerns about what might be some of the material factors associated with these increased uh, propensity for these shooting deaths, specifically of African-American men, but not exclusively, by the way, African-American men. And based on actual experiences I had, one of my concerns was that there was something connected to the bonds um, for the city. And that's something concerning the financial transactions that went into the uh, arrangements associated with bonds may have something to do with what happened in the encounter between the police and the individual that allowed for the increase in a kind of temperament or radio frequency disparity that compelled two different kinds of action in the moment, i.e. somebody gets trigger happy and or uh, sees that somebody is a threat that needs to be taken down in a very assertive, even violent um uh, in, in fatal manner and somebody else for whatever reason ends up feeling like they have to respond or gets momentarily scared or like all of a sudden they have to justify something and maybe they try to pull out their phone. All of these definitions or all these descriptions that had been circulating about what was actually happening in the encounter. Okay. And so there was some, my theory was that something was happening to code via some form of a radio frequency or something else that I understood was connected in a manner to the bonding uh, for the municipality, code each of them to be on a different frequency that at some point a concurrent transaction allowed for a momentary spike that excitated a form of response that somebody ended up pulling the gun on and shooting the guy. And so the question was, well, what is that? That it's not just about bad training and it's not just about uh, blind racism. 
Now, there's actually different frequencies that one has when they engage the cops. And the cops have it too. And I had already experienced this both in, a, in the city hall and also my, myself when I went to the police stations or would be in a proximity to the police, including very far away from the police, but in moments that ran concurrent to what later turned out to be police shootings. So what was it about the differences in the free radio frequency and the uh, vibrational energy that was going on in the actual encounter with the individual and the police that made that moment fatal? That there was actually something that was being predetermined to create possibilities that justify turning a otherwise normal or what it could have been just a, a regular or uh, a de-escalated encounter into a fatal encounter. What was that? Why did they need to use that specific encounter to open up liquidity in that manner? Right? Now, I didn't identify it as liquidity at the time. What I did do is I tried to uh, make a very nascent uh, concept of a potential investigation into the concept of municipal bonding and some of the potential qualms with um, municipal bonding. And the tone I did it was the tone I did it in. Did that excitate a specific reaction? Did I use a tone or effectuate some form of vibrational resonance that elicited or excitated a response from that person or people who read it that then comported their behavior accordingly in what is now going on over four years? Well, do you want to talk about bonds? Do you want to talk about how BLM has been running directly concurrently to policy changes at the Bureau of Land Management and among other things associated with bonds on mineral leases that can be very short term, like maybe long enough for a big public event with a lot of surveillance perhaps making digital duplicates of pooled asset bases fitting specific racial demographics. And especially if you're in a hierarchized uh, kind of organizational structure that says that people of color have a particular leadership role and their allies have another one. You have more than one pooled asset base that has a distinct kind of this, you know, uh, association, uh, almost like layers of sediment in a mineral bed, for instance. And then you talk about how, at least in the last six months, at four alleged shootings by police that were fatal involved individuals whose last names were connected to major cases concerning either large-scale securities fraud or public corruption on a time frame when there was actually active municipal bond issues pending. Nobody has talked about what is that doing to concepts of racial justice, especially when you talk about a core component of any justice, which is ownership of the means of production and having the right to self-determine how one is represented as well as engaging around what's considered to be your value. Why, for the last six months, have we been subjected to a campaign of intentional racialization around concepts of justice, while there's also intentional racialization around death counts connected to an actual bioterror attack being misrepresented as a health pandemic, and nobody is talking about the gross malfeasance that's happening with the financial system up to and including the federal government, Congress, and the Senate, and the bonds, the literal bonds, and the literal cases associated with named references to people getting murdered that provide the capital necessary for the criminal culprits to get the kind of political risk insurance they need on calling those people out to the street to be mined for their minerals in public. Now, is one supposed to feel good or affirmed that there haven't been any lone white school shooters during this time? No, we've got a different white menace, don't we? 
right? And it's important to also see that in the context of this racialization, that prior to the Black Lives Matter and the racial justice protests as racial justice protests, there were also movements of people, by and large, represented in the media as white, though not at the time white supremacist, that were protesting the requirements for a facial mask as being a violation of constitutional rights to freedom of assembly, and people were violating and engaging in civil disobedience around collective action and mass protest of these infringements upon political rights. Well, where is that? in consideration of a movement for justice right now. I mean, it is uh, October 27, 2020 at 9.46 a.m. How many callbacks have I gotten in the last five years? How many reports have been closed out in the last five years? How many cops took a report on the murder of another cop in the last five years? Let me ask you this. How many people that were murdered by cops got in contact with me about pension fraud? Is it because I didn't kill who you said I needed to kill in order to qualify as a member of the movement? Was I under the wrong command authority? 